In this video, I'm going to be giving you my summary and analysis of Inside Bill's Brain, Decoding Bill Gates. This is an original Netflix documentary. It's a three-part series that was created by David Guggenheim. He's the same guy who's behind An Inconvenient Truth which Al, with Al Gore, which was that big kind of game-changing documentary about climate change. Uh, he's the same guy that was behind that. So a uh, major documentary and goes into a lot of detail on kind of modeling Bill Gates. And this is something that I'm known for. I've created a modeling report and sort of course on Elon Musk and doing a similar type of analysis. So we're gonna be going through my notes here, which you'll be able to download in a, there'll be a link down in the description. Uh, we're gonna be going through my notes on uh, these different aspects and all the different things that I learned about Bill Gates through this. And a lot of these things are things that I've never seen elsewhere before. He got quite a bit of access to Bill to put this together. There's stuff about Warren Buffett. So uh, I'm just gonna do all this in one cut. And if you want the notes, they'll be down below. So let's get into it. So the documentary starts off with um, David Guggenheim, the, the creator, uh, talking about how he met Bill. And it was at a film festival and Bill was just sitting there in a chair reading the Minnesota state budget. And he had 37 more of these budgets in this huge bag. And you'll see a picture of it in the documentary. It's a huge bag, um, canvas bag that he carries all his books and all his stuff in. And there'll be more details about that later in the video. Uh, and he was just sitting there going line by line through the state budget. So it gives you a sense of the kind of stuff that he reads. And there's a whole list of things and we'll get more into that later in, in the video and in the notes. But let's get into the Think Week. Bill does these twice a year, one week alone in a cabin each time. He'll go to Hood Canal in Washington, Washington State. And uh, this is near Puget Sound, and this is where his family's from. This is where his parents lived, a uh, similar area kind of neighborhood. There was a guy in the documentary, a friend, or somebody high up in the in Microsoft who said he read 14 books in a day and it was 150 pages an hour. Uh, there were various anecdotes like this of people kind of commenting about how fast he reads or how much he knows. I didn't take, I, I wouldn't put too much stock in these things because at the end of the day, these people describing him, all of them came away kind of mystified and, and confused about how he even does what he does. And they don't seem to, you know, there there is a little bit of, I think, um, buffing up of what he's actually doing and kind of overemphasizing or over-exaggerating things. So I didn't take too much of that. I, I think a lot of this is actually skimming. So I think part of what he does is he gets a lot of books. He mentioned he doesn't just get one book on a subject, but he'll get five books. And then he's probably skimming through them. And if he finds something he's interested in, then he'll dive deeper into that. He did talk about taking notes in the margins, but when he actually showed his books, none of them had notes in the margins. He would have a sheet of, uh, looked like a legal pad, but it was regular letter length. He'd just have that on the desk next to him. Um, and he wouldn't be taking a ton of notes and he'd show his notes and it would just be one or two pages on the front, you know, blank page or two of the book that he was reading. So they didn't show him taking a huge amount of notes. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. Um, but it looked like he wasn't taking a huge amount of notes in the margins and stuff like that. So it still kind of remains to be seen. Um, I, I think he does a combination of some things he'll skim a lot and then dive deeper into, and then some things he will read in depth. Uh, one major thing that came up was the UN World Report. This was given as a recommendation to him by Dr. Bill Fogey. And he was a former director of the CDC and later director of the Carter Center. So that's Jimmy Carter, uh, former president. So major high up guy and... Uh, this got him interested. This was the World Development Report from 1993. And this kind of opened up Bill's eyes to what kind of philanthropy he should be doing. So I did some additional research and 
basically what happened was that Bill, when he got started in philanthropy, they were basically giving away computers. And this was part of a larger thing that both Microsoft and Apple were doing of trying to get their computers and their operating systems into the schools just in the United States. And they would give special discounts to schools. And part of the idea there is, well, if we can get kids learning how to use our computer and our OS at an early age, then they're gonna buy our computers or buy our OS and our software when they become adults. And plus they were selling computers, not just to one classroom or one school, but actually the entire school system. And sometimes even bigger than that, you know, groups of school systems because they all wanted to be running on the same stuff and just for efficiency, they wanted all of one thing. And so they'd be buying hundreds or thousands of computers at a time. So giving away computers is part of that, but he found that it, that was, was only going so far and he wanted to do more. And so uh, this idea of getting into medical philanthropy and public health, that's what got him going. That, that was one of the things that got him going down this road. And so Bill, this Bill Fogey guy, guy has been a mentor from all the way back then. Uh, when so Bill and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was founded in 2000, and so he's been mentoring them since then and even before on kind of what are the major issues, what should they focus on, and uh, and so that was a key thing that he pulled out of his library and he was showing, hey, this is one of the things that I read, um, and in the documentary there's pictures of his huge library and. You know, he had a shelf of this one guy who's obsessed with energy. And we'll get into later in the philanthropy section, the different areas, sectors he's interested in. But he found this one guy who was like a specialist on energy. And he had bought every single book by that guy and read all of them, or at least skimmed them. Um, he'd open up the books. You wouldn't see notes in the margins of any of them. So that's kind of what I was getting at earlier. Um, this is something that I do and I recommend to people. If you find somebody who's really an expert in something you care about, you need to buy every single book that they have, every single course that they have, and just go through all of it. Not necessarily deeply and, and scour everything, but you need to at least skim everything they've done because that's how you find things where you didn't know you were looking for it, but once you discover it, you're like, oh, wow, that's actually connected. And it's, it's a key area where, way you can sort of move horizontally between disciplines. So it was really cool to see that um, Bill does that. Uh, so then he 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 talked about you know metaphor of his brain as CPU time and the Think Week as writing things down to tell his brain what to think about. So writing things down is kind of giving an instruction to his brain. And it even hinted he didn't say this, but it hinted at this idea of kind of giving your subconscious mind instructions of what to work on. And then some writers talk about they'll write stuff down before they go to sleep and their brain will kind of work on it overnight. Memory consolidation, there's a bunch of science about that. So that could have been part of what's going on there. So what he does is he writes down questions of the uh, what he wants to achieve on these think weeks. And then that structures the rest of his work. And I've talked about this with the learning project template that I talk about in my learning course. So you want to have deliverables of what is this learning project for final outcomes. And there's also an area for questions. And sometimes just answering questions can be the deliverable. So um, he gave some examples. When will low interest rates end? So this is part of how governments manage the economy is they what is the interest rate that they give out? Is it a low interest rate? If it's a low interest rate, it makes people want to borrow more and sort of invest more in their businesses. If the interest rate is high, they don't want to take out as much loans. So, uh, he, uh, yeah, so he, he sort of thought about questions as code. Um, why isn't the clinic working better? So he has these clinics that he funds in different countries and so, you know, he'd ask, why aren't they working better? And then he'd go spend some time on that. Uh, is the private sector good at this? Do they have the capacity? So this is another question in philanthropy of, should we just pay a company to do this? Or should we create 
a nonprofit and then do it ourselves. It's kind of like in government. Should we use contractors to do this or should we do this sort of indigenously? So um, there were also two books on the screen. Um, one was Steven Pinker, Enlightenment Now, and another one was Educated, Tara Westover. This educated one was interesting as a memoir of a woman who grew up in sort of an isolated, uh, I think out West and her family, her father didn't believe in public education and she didn't even have a birth certificate. And she was like isolated until she turned 18 or something close to that. Then she wa wanted to go to college. She ended up, I think, becoming a Rhodes Scholar. And then she wrote this memoir and, and doing all a bunch of like scientific or academic achievements. And then Steven Pinker, Enlightenment Now. Steven Pinker is a very influential person in the um, sort of new atheist and sort of humanism, humanist, uh, sort of rationalist um, mindset and sort of kind of a post-Christian uh, human rights paradigm. And this is the major paradigm within the international community and international philanthropy um, and so this is a key insight into sort of his philosophy, his religious background. Um, Melinda is a Catholic, at least she was raised Catholic and, and says she's a Catholic. There was a little bit of ambiguity about, you know, where that stands now. Um, somebody was sort of commenting on her, but, um, that was kind of interesting. Uh, so do we know... What is in human sewage? That was another question. Um, this question wasn't necessarily a think we question. It was more of this is how he approaches learning projects. So one of the things he found was a major need was sanitation. And there's an acronym they use called wa uh, WASH. Water, W-A, S, sanitation, H, hygiene. This is a major area of philanthropy and where a lot of disease comes from. So diarrhea kills a huge amount of people in the third world. And sanitation is a major problem. They have these huge cities. There's these huge slums. They don't, they never installed running water and, and like basic plumbing. And so people are just going out in these holes and stuff and there, it doesn't drain anywhere. There's all these like major issues. And so he need to figure out, you know, how to solve that because it was leading to a lot of deaths. And we'll get into this later as well, but part of what uh, Bill f wanted to focus on was is where can he bring his innovation to the table and where can he also invest in things that other people won't invest in or don't care about because there's like public perception issues with it. So sanitation is not a sexy area to get into. Another one is nuclear power, which a lot of people are also kind of scared of and avoid. So he wanted to get into these areas where there wasn't the public will to either donate money to it or for governments to handle it. And so he could take his foundation's money and make a dent in those issues that kind of wouldn't get solved because there were kind of public perception or marketing reasons why it wasn't going to get public support, even though it was important. So uh, what do I need to read about that? Who do I need to talk to? And then sometimes he just needs to think about something. And I think this is important also is you don't always have to be active. You don't always have to be doing something. Sometimes you just need to sit or go on a walk or going on a drive and don't do anything. But it is very important, you know, the, the more money you have, and even if you don't have money, but you, you just do cold calling and cold emailing uh, or just participate in forums, participate on Stack Exchange or Quora is talk to people. Don't just go on blogs and Google and read books. Actually talk to somebody. And this is very important in the early stage. You know, going back to him talking to Bill Fogey and getting his advice, he got a reading list from Bill of 81 books and resources for him to read. And that was, this is very similar actually to what Elon Musk did. So when Elon Musk wanted to figure out how am I going to build rockets, he went to a university professor who was an expert in rocketry and he said, hey, what textbook should I be reading? What books do I need to read? So he got a reading list, which is basically what a syllabus is in college or anywhere. Anytime you're taking a course or a class, like a traditional class, 
there's a reading list. And from my point of view, it's sort of like babysitting. It's like, okay, guys, this week you're going to read this. You have to read this. Um, but when you're self-directed and when you're one of these kind of high-performance self-directed students like Elon Musk or Bill Gates, you don't need somebody sort of watching over you and be like, okay, make sure you read this. Make sure you you know, take notes on this. Make sure you blah, blah, blah. Um, these guys just do it themselves. They don't need the babysitting. So it's kind of the pure essence of what they should be doing. And then they have experts they can talk to when they need to, to say, okay, what do I read next? Or, hey, these are my thoughts. What do you think? And this is something I like to do sometimes is I'll read a book. I'll actually pay an expert to also read that book and then talk to me about it afterwards. Or if they've already read it, they can do a quick skim of it before we talk, but I'll literally kind of read the book. Then immediately after that, have a phone call with them, sometimes two, three hours and just go through the book and say, Hey, this is what I thought about. This, this is what I thought about that. What do you think? So those are some ideas of how to do that. Um, and you know, a lot of subjects where there's a huge amount of people who are, you know, have bachelors or a masters in something you can find people for not that much per hour you know, 25 to $50 an hour who can, you know, get help you get up to speed in pretty much any kind of traditional college topic. So another thing that was interesting is he drinks a lot of Diet Coke. And you'll see that in the documentary. There's like three or four cans on the desk over a period of a few hours. He's at one point, he's doing a puzzle with Melinda and he's drinking a Diet Coke. Um, at one point he opens up this mini fridge and it's literally full of like dozens of just Diet Coke, nothing else in there. Uh, so I th thought that was kind of funny. Um, it, Elon Musk actually drinks a lot of Diet Coke also. Um, and Warren Buffett owns a lot of Coca-Cola. So um, who knows if that's necessarily part of it, but uh, Warren Buffett's a major kind of mentor and friend of Bill and we'll get into their relationship later on in the video. So he's looking out at the water. Same thing with his uh, office at at the uh, foundation, which is also in Seattle. So uh, his his office is actually very, you could kind of compare it to the layout of um, the Oval Office in the White House and the, uh, the conference room right off to it. It's the exact same kind of L-shape format. Bill's office is not, a, is not oval, it, it's a rectangle. He's got a small desk in front of him and then a larger desk to the side of him, to his left side. He's got like a big screen in front of him and then he has a, a separate laptop off to the left. And um, sometimes he'll work in the conference room, sometimes he'll work at his desk. Um, and so there's, you'll see that in the documentary. Um, I thought there was a really, this was not something Bill said, this was something that David, the creator of the documentary said, he said, it seems in Bill's new phase of his life, he's turned his whole life into one long continuous think week. And uh, I thought that was pretty a pretty profound thing. W one of the larger patterns is that in the documentary as a whole, a lot of the more incisive details are not provided by Bill, but by the people around him. So you always have to take, I mean, you have to take it with a grain of salt either way. But that was a little bit frustrating that a lot of times it was coming from other people and it was a little bit kind of seemed a little bit like guesswork. So, uh, but yeah, you know, Bill, Bill talks about his childhood quite a bit and growing up, how he kind of isolated himself in his room, was constantly reading, reading everything. Elon Musk has a very similar history of his childhood where he kind of isolate, excuse me himself in reading got into computers in eighth grade there was a special computer club at a school his school was one of the first very wealthy private school uh one of the first to have a computer terminal the reason why it's called a terminal is because the actual computer was elsewhere it was kind of in the cloud like a supercomputer miles and miles away and then they had a terminal which would allow you to sort of remote control like remote desktop so that's why it's called a, a terminal um so he has a book bag, which is refreshed weekly. His assistant goes in, you know, shows all these different books that are going in the book bag, bag, wide variety of things, including there was a crypto book. 
So that was interesting. Um, and, and this was filmed, I think, back in 2017, 2018. Um, the documentary itself came out in 2019. So um, I'm going to be doing a separate video on the uh, 60 Minutes interview that Charlie Rose did with him back, I think, in 2011 or 2013, where you'll see more detail about um, his some of his notes and some of his book bag and, and the teaching company courses he takes. Uh, so I'll cover that in a separate video. Um, make sure you're subscribed or on my email list if you want to make sure you get that. I also have a YouTube playlist just on Bill Gates. So that'll be in the description as well. And you'll if you like this video, you'll probably like those as well. Um, I try not to have too much overlap between the videos. So um, he, in eighth grade, he scored top in his state, you know, Washington State in math of everybody from grades eight to 12. So, you know, major, majorly top student, top intellect at a young age. Um, and he started working on computers. Paul Allen with, was a kid at his school who was two years older and was also part of the computer club. They worked together. Um, they worked on the scheduling problem to schedule every single student at the school. And the school had just merged. It was an all-boys school. It just merged with an all-girls school. And they had to figure out a calendar. They had to figure out and calculate the schedule for every single student. And they were moving across different buildings and stuff. So there are all these constraints. So it's it's pretty amazing that he was working that at some, such a young age. Um, but that set him up to be to build Microsoft with Paul Allen. So and this was another thing that came from, I believe, Melinda. She said that Bill's approach is he creates a framework for each area he's concerned with. And he breaks it down into the different subsectors. And then he learns about each of those. And I think the notes elsewhere in, in these notes, but it's basically the bullet point. But basically, she said his mind is like an Excel spreadsheet. And he slots things into whatever category that it fits into. So if you're interested in this, I have a whole two hour video where I went through, I read and did a commentary of the entire Library of Congress classification system. And there's also something later in this video about how he thinks about energy and the different sources of pollution and how he thinks about those as separate sectors. People, it's, it's very fashionable right now. People talk about, oh, don't use classifications, don't use hierarchy, don't use categories you have a flat thing and everything's like a cloud and everything's you know interconnected and it is it, it's kind of there are benefits to having that interconnection it's not like it's totally wrong but i found over and over and over again that people that are very high performers that's not actually how they approach things and people in government that are funding a huge amount of research and people in academia that's really generally not how they do things so, and even Wikipedia, Wikipedia seems flat on the surface, but if you actually go to the bottom, those boxes with all the blue links, those are all a hierarchy in categories and subcategories. And all the major pages on Wikipedia are structured within those categories and subcategories. They're also interlinked heavily. So it's not that you can't have interlinking and kind of a flat structure just because you have a category system in a taxonomy. You can actually have both. And what you ideally want is the best, best of both worlds. You want to have the best taxonomy you can come up with. Nothing's going to be perfect. It's always going to be biased to some extent. But it's almost always better to have it than not. And then combined with that, you have heavy interlinking. And you can actually have multiple hierarchies at the same time. Wikipedia also has this. So um, I only make that point because it's so fashionable nowadays to get rid of hierarchies and it's just not the most effective approach. It's it's better to blend them with and kind of have the best of both worlds. So uh, I already mentioned climate, this climate guy, and uh, he wanted to understand the full cycle and dynamics of energy. And one of the interesting things, you know, philanthropy and, and emissions and climate change is if everybody on the world worked, had used the same amount of energy as Americans and other people in first world countries, it wouldn't be possible. With the current amount of energy and even if you used all the fossil fuels um it's just not possible for everybody to live that lifestyle and so and to even for 
people in first world countries to have the lifestyle we have now, you have to be using a massive amount of energy. And that's not often realized because it's kind of invisible. We don't interact with it a lot, but energy and the full life cycle of energy is extremely important. And this is something, um, you know, fertilizer is another example of something that's kind of boring, but it's actually, you can't have huge population growth like we've had without energy, uh, without a fertilizer and petroleum products go into fertilizer. Nitrogen goes into fertilizer. So there's all these interconnections and it's evident that Bill really likes to get into the details. Another thing that you see with Elon Musk, he really gets into the details and wants to know the different branches of science and how practically speaking, they're implemented into these large industries and, and the full life cycle of beginning to end, or even the full cycle, you know, kind of like the water cycle of it goes into the clouds and it rains down, goes into the water basins and everything, and then gets, you know, blah, 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 the whole cycle. <laughs> Uh, so that's the learning aspect. Um, let's get into thinking next. Very quick thinker, got very quick with math early. And I think this is quite important. I had a, I had this kind of thing when I was going through uh, grade school and it's, it's actually really interesting how much of math confidence just comes from being able to literally just memorize like the 12 by 12 times table. It's amazing how important that is. It seems like such a, like with everybody like, oh, you just look stuff up on Google. But um, if you can't do basic mental math and I have a whole course on mental math, if you want to check it out, it's all about practical mental math. It's not memorizing cards or other, you know, vanity stuff like tricks. It's about real mental math. But uh, he played a phonograph in the documentary where it's like, 13 plus 17, and then a second or two later, the answer, 30. So, uh, and it would just go like that. It was a loop. So I guess that was a way he practiced or something. They didn't give in the full details, or I guess they played, the whole class would listen to that and try to f solve the problems. And I guess you could speed up or slow down the phonograph so you can make it harder over time and uh, kind of like Tetris. So um, that was in or Guitar Hero kind of similar dynamic. Um, one of the first questions he was asked at the beginning of the docu was, uh, what was his biggest fear? And he said, losing his mind. So Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative disease. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, he also admitted pretty openly, like he's been criticized for trying to use tech to fix everything. And he was pretty open about agreeing with that, that, you know, it is kind of his hammer and he has a bias of wanting to fix everything with that. Um, one of the things I was struck by was just, he wasn't, he wasn't so as defensive as I guess I thought he might be like, he was kind of, he was pretty kind of open about what his biases were, what some of his weaknesses were and kind of didn't care as much um, seemed like he didn't care about people's opinions as much as maybe he used to, or maybe he never did, you know, it, it's kind of, um, hard for me to say, but, uh, th there did seem to be a bit of a freedom and a bit of not caring as much anymore about what people thought. So, um, and, and a f there was a follow-up question where it's like, he was talking about, um, these these things that he does with philanthropy and the doc uh, david who was interviewing him was saying well that's not very inspiring bill and then bill was like i'm not trying to inspire i'm trying to build efficiency actually i remember the story now it was his daughter he was showing his daughter uh, a victim of polio who was on these crutches and then he explained to her how he was you know trying to vaccinate everybody with pol the polio vaccine and then his daughter asks, yeah, but what did you do about that specific woman? And that question is never answered in the documentary, but David then asks him, well, you know, it's not that inspiring to, you know, cure a million people. It's kind of, I think it was Stalin who said, you know, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. 
there's sort of the corollary to that, which is in philanthropy, people really care about saving one death or one child's life, but they don't care about saving a million. And so, um, you know, this, the feed a child um, charity where they'll have the picture of the starving child on the outside of the envelope and it really pulls at people's heartstrings. They're, they don't put statistics on those letters because it doesn't work. It doesn't get people emotionally to care. And so this gets into kind of the larger rationalist um, kind of um, effective altruism is a movement that's kind of grown out of this same concept of how do we, how do you think kind of like a venture capitalist or venture philanthropist where it's like, how do I invest money most efficiently to get the most bang for my buck in terms of improving people's lives or improving the planet? And that's not as sexy and as inspiring as telling stories about individuals kind of overcoming things or, or saving one person. And so there was an interesting kind of disconnect there between the author's kind of paradigm and, and Bill's focus on efficiency and numbers and scale and not so much an individual kind of case study. And uh, it goes into what I said before about him wanting to take on those challenges where governments and the general populace donating money are not going to solve certain problems because they're not sexy or they have these problems where they're just not inspiring. So there's an interesting paradigm shift where it's it's really the opposite. He's really trying to solve the problem because of you know, the public's inability to care about certain problems because they're not inspiring or they're not sexy or whatever. And in the same way, that was kind of, that's always been kind of the problem with climate change. And that was part of the goal of the Al Gore Inconvenient Truth movie was to get people to emotionally care about climate change and pollution and all this stuff. And so, uh, you know, maybe, maybe David wasn't on the other side of the fence, but was trying to pull that dichotomy out for the viewer it's hard to say i think you know now that i think about it, maybe that was what he was trying to do um so i thought another interesting thing is that he likes to pace bill likes to pace and just go on walks so a lot of the interviews were actually walks where david and bill would be walking side by side the cameraman was maybe 10, 20 paces back, just filming their backs and they'd be talking and they probably had wireless mics on or something. And I think, you know, part of that is somebody like Bill, they, they go into Bill's childhood of like, he was really kind of antisocial and, and, or just socially anxious or whatever. Like his parents did thing, this will come up later in his relationships, but his parents like forced him to do certain social activities to just build his social skills. Like his father was part of the American Bar Association. And so Bill would get put in a tuxedo and he'd be a greeter. He'd greet people at the door, kind of like a Walmart greeter, kind of just greet people at the door and, and say hi to them and welcome to them, them to the event. So my guess is that like sitting down with Bill and having a camera and all this stuff pointed at him, more of his guard is up versus if the cameraman's behind him and he's in his element walking and it's the two of them walking side by side, he doesn't have to look at anybody's face. Um, that could take his guard down. So um, I think that was potentially why it was set up that way. And yeah, so uh, that's kind of a side thing. Um, but just in terms of thinking, you know, if you feel like somebody's watching you all the time and you're trying to do work, it can add an extra stress because it's like, oh, I have to be worried about what somebody else is thinking the whole time. I have to sort of manage my impression. So there's a, you know, one way you can use this is by eliminating those kind of situations where you have somebody watching over you or kind of hovering over you or looking at you or distracting somebody you're trying to interview by doing that. So putting whoever you're trying to interview or a mentor you have or whatever, putting them at ease and, you know, understanding their kind of 
how they like to process things and, and what gives them anxiety or what puts extra pressure on them. So he also said, uh, so Melinda was the one who said he likes to, when they're in this family space, I don't know if it was a dining room or whatever, um, he likes to pace back and forth when he's thinking about things and helps him organize his brain. There's some interesting stuff in, in the information retrieval literature about how animals have certain hunting and gathering and sort of patterns of walking around foraging behavior. And there's a, a thing called information foraging. So this there's actually been some interesting scientific work on this of like, there's actually algorithms for the optimal way to forage for stuff. And scientists have been looking at is there, can you bring that over to uh, information search or in, information foraging? And it's, it's basically a search algorithm. And if you've ever learned about basic search algorithms, one major difference is like, do you do depth first or breadth first? Which means if you have 10 books, a breadth first would be just look at the table of contents of each of the 10 books and then decide what to do next. A depth search would be pick one book and then read that whole book, then pick the next book and then read that whole book. And so, you know, taking that a step further is the breadth first search you might go through the table contents of each book and then read the introduction of each book. And that would take you sort of two layers deep instead of just one layer. So, uh, you know, optimal foraging behavior is like, do you explore more one area that you're already in kind of looking for food, one small area, do you, you explore it in depth or do you go to a new area that hasn't been explored yet? It's a classic, classic explore versus exploit problem. Do you create a new product or do you improve your, improve your existing product? Same kind of thing in, in a different guise. So um, it is interesting that he likes to walk around, but it's kind of a way to just la allow his brain to think. And, and it's almost an excuse to not do anything. And, and in our culture, you sometimes feel the need to do that because it's like you need to always be doing something. You always need to be active. And internal activity is not valued or because it's hard to measure, it's not appreciated. Um, and it's one of the weaknesses of productivity because it's kind of like what you can't measure, you can't manage. And so you end up trying to manage people and, and they end up not being able to do that internal thinking work because they have no freedom to just do from the outside what looks like doing nothing. And as a manager, you're like, well, how do I manage somebody when they're just thinking and I don't know what they're doing? They could be thinking about anything. So it's a classic kind of problem. And uh, this was not in the documentary, but it's a separate thing. Uh, Microsoft's headquarters is called a campus and they've done things to organize it kind of like a university. And part of the reason why for that is it allows people to think, it gives people time. Um, in a separate video, Bill talked about how they've institutionalized Think Week where like, I think the top 50 engineers all go on a think week once a, a year and they write up papers and then everybody reads the different papers and they talk about them and recommend ideas to different divisions within the company, different product groups. So uh, Bill has done a lot of things to kind of bring that academic sensibility to his company. And this is a big part behind like knowledge, you know, early corporate knowledge management and uh, all that stuff, knowledge-based economy, knowledge-based company, where the a lot of the value of the company is in the knowledge the company has, which is not true nearly as much with the industrial revolution and a company like Ford or GM or, you know, car companies, for example, or, or anything where they're just pumping out physical products. So he also said, you have to decide what you want to care about or what you should care about. And there's a finite amount of things. So he found he can't do everything. He needs to focus on a few things and go deep into them. And we'll get more into that later with how he's decided what to focus on within philanthropy and his foundation. So Another thing that was kind of interesting, and 
they announced their divorce, I think about a year ago. It's early, it's February, 2022 when I'm recording this. And I think it's within the last year that they announced their divorce. So one thing that you can't help but think about when you're watching the documentary is like, like anything they say, you wonder, and I don't want to get into it in this video, but it, you know, if you like sort of analyzing relationships, there there are some interesting nuggets in the in the documentary of like little things Melinda says or little things, uh, jokes Bill cracks about kind of what's going on with them and their relationship. So, um, I think the documentary is worth watching, even if you want to get these notes and my analysis. Um, because Microsoft has had and Bill has had such a huge impact both in philanthropy and and you know Warren Buffett giving the majority of his money I think 31 billion to the Gates Foundation to give away to philanthropy so you have Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and Bill Gates has mentored Mark Zuckerberg so there's an intellectual lineage there from Buffett to Gates to Zuckerberg so that's another key thing you don't when you think about Steve Jobs, you think about Elon Musk, there isn't any lineage there. So that line, that academic, in academia, it's the genealogy or the lineage of like, who is your PhD advisor or dissertation advisor, and then going, tracing somebody's lineage back. That's a very, for anybody in academia, you're, you always want to do that when you're learning about a new person, because it gives you a lot of information on their worldview and, and their theoretical kind of structures that they use. So, um, I thought that was pretty interesting. And uh, I'm going to, I have another note later on Mark Zuckerberg as well and some similarities. So Melinda said she wouldn't want to be in Bill's brain. It's total chaos. There's so much going on. He loves complexity. He thrives on complexity. And I think, you know, this is what I was saying earlier about a lot of the stuff about how Bill thinks actually comes from these secondhand sources. And you start to wonder, like, if none of these people are at Bill's IQ level and they're all kind of talking about him, but then none of them, they all kind of preface their thoughts by saying, like, I don't really understand him or he's a genius or like, I don't know how he does it. So I just, um, you know, does he actually thrive on complexity or his... He just taking on stuff that's more complex than what the speaker can themselves handle or want has an interest in handling. So Melinda was like a, a really impressive force in terms of her career. They get into that. I don't want to spend time on that, but like very male dominated field. And she rose up to be, I think, head of a division. And uh, so I'm sure she could get into this stuff. I got more of the the sense that she didn't, she wasn't interested in that more than she couldn't, she couldn't do it even if she wanted to. Um, but he is interested in a lot of subjects. And I talked about this framework thing and him slotting things into different categories. So, um, and you know, there is overlap. So, you know, thinking things come up throughout, um, getting into planning. Um, one major thing was optimism. There were his sisters, both of his older sisters were in the documentary. And one of them really made a point of how he was a very happy boy as a baby. He was always smiling, always optimistic. He just has a very optimistic outlook. And, and this is one of the interesting things in the kind of academic success literature which is you find people who are very successful are almost always very optimistic. There's some exceptions to that. One of the interesting things in how to think like a POTUS course that I finished late last year is that uh, JFK's father, JPK, was hugely, hugely successful in multiple industries, in finance and then in Hollywood as a studio owner. And yet he was quite pessimistic or always looking for the downside, always worried that things were going to go sour and kind of hedging against that. He predicted the, uh, the stock market crash of 1928, 29, the great depression. 
and he actually made money on the way up and on the way down. He got out a little bit early, and then when he st he predicted things were going to start going down, he he bought um, instruments that allowed him to make money on the way down, basically shorting the market. Um, so, and there's a saying within Silicon Valley: only the paranoid survive. So, and and Bill was quite paranoid when he was in his very intense days at Microsoft where he was constantly worried about competitors taking over his market share. And so sometimes you do see, I wouldn't say it's as simple as just being optimistic, but I think, I think it's a little bit more nuanced where it's like kind of at a global level and optimism, but also kind of hope for the best, but also prepare for the worst. So have like a gl global idea of like, don't be pessimistic, like plan as if things are going to eventually work out in your favor, but at the same time, make sure you do some amount of hedging to prevent the worst. And and th part of how Elon Musk has talked about um, what he's doing for climate change and electrification and batteries and going to Mars is like Mars is kind of a backup if things you know, may, nuclear war or something on the on the uh, on Earth, but also when he talks about climate change, he says, "Well, I don't think it is is as bad as a lot of people think, but at the same time, we're going to run out of energy in forty, fifty years, anyways. So why take the risk of doing all this extra pollution if in a few decades we're going to have to electrify anyways, even if climate change isn't real or isn't that bad? So it's like, why take that risk if we're going to have to do it anyways?" So it's it's being kind of optimistic, but on the same time hedging and, and preparing against the worst and kind of thinking about it rationally or from a risk management perspective. So that's kind of, I, I think it's somewhat nuanced, but there is an overarching optimism about, hey, we can solve problems, we can, we can improve things. There was also an example day. It was very kind of highly edited so there, the reason there's some X's here is because the, and, and inconsistent data here is because it's just not, it's not even 100% clear if this was one day. I mean, this is kind of like an ideal, I, I view this as kind of an ideal day, like a, a perfect model day. And I doubt his usual day is like this, but so AI tech review one hour. And I also made a note, you know, this is very presidential. So people sometimes wonder like, why did I put together this? What's with all this presidential branding? Well, I started finding as I modeled people who are at the top of their fields and these tech, you know, Bill Gates and other people kind of, especially as people transition from industry into philanthropy. And you notice that that uh, Jimmy Carter thing. Jimmy Carter is probably the biggest kind of, he was kind of a disappointment in that he was a one-term president and he was also probably the highest IQ president and like the most intellectual nerdy president ever. And that was um, kind of, I don't want to get into all the details, but like he's been extremely influential in doing ph philanthropic stuff and using his, the kind of presidential advantage um, to, to negotiate between countries and do a lot of philanthropic work. So it's very notable that Bill Gates hired a guy who was working for President Carter at the Carter Foundation previously. And people going from working at the CDC, major government position to working in philanthropy and the kind of revolving door, not quite a revolving door, but kind of an interconnection there. So uh, you see later on in the documentary, they actually show a meeting, a planning meeting. And these are something presidents also have. Presidents have a whole team called the planning and scheduling team. And they schedule out, they have like weekly, monthly, and, and a three month view. And they have meetings where separately they put together a calendar and a schedule, and then they show it to the principal or the president or you know Bill Gates in this situation. And they kind of show him what they put together and then the principal will have whatever comments they have and change around anything they want to change. And so like having a technology one hour briefing is a very common thing for any executive or president or, you know, government leader to have one and a half hour meeting with Terra Power. So Terra Power is the company Bill created 
to build the uh, nuclear power thing, which we'll talk more about later. Then he's got a board of directors meeting. So he left as a CEO, but he stayed on as the board of directors. So board of directors sets out the strategic plan and the CEO is more of day to day. And the chief of operations is below the CEO, and they're even more of a day-to-day. CEO is a little bit of a between of setting some of the vision, some of the strategy, but also doing external stuff, sitting down for interviews, the political angles of things, um, interacting with CEOs of other companies. So there's a bit of a ceremonial and sort of external role there, external facing, whereas the COO is more internal facing. Um, Tim Cook of Apple was the COO before he became the CEO when Steve Jobs died. So there's another example there. And there's been other COOs who have recently become um, CEOs of major tech companies. Um, So this is a common transition thing where they go from being CEO to board of directors. Then he has a half hour lunch. I thought that was pretty interesting, like kind of a no frills lunch, not taking an hour. He's pro- If it's a half hour, he's probably eating alone, I would guess. Um, call with Warren Buffett. Meeting on sanitation. So they gave times for the first three things and then it got more kind of loose. Um, so sanitation meetings, so that's another one of his major things is improving sanitation, getting rid of diarrhea and, and like building out that infrastructure of basically indoor plumbing or equivalents to that, to cut down on diarrhea and other major issues like that. Then he has an education strategy review, interview with a journalist, and then spending some time at the IV lab. I, I don't, I wasn't able to figure out what the IV lab is. Um, but yeah, uh, he had his assistant, they interviewed her and she was talking about, um, the, the company title that they had for her was gate ventures. So that's, I guess the company that she works for or that, you know, there's all sorts of different companies. Um, time is the one commodity he can't buy more of. And you see him in the video carrying that big canvas bag to work. You also see it's only one sh- or two shots of it, but there's a large brown, dark brown leather bag that he carries around. If you've seen the uh, bag that Joe Biden carries around to and from work, it's the very similar kind of bag. So it's kind of like a soft, fairly thick briefcase, but it's it's not a briefcase. It's a soft-sided thing. Um and so who knows if he actually carries this. I, I kind of doubt that he actually carries this bag to work every day. I, I got the sense that some of this stuff was a little bit staged for the documentary um, or idealized. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't in, in the video. That's what they show him doing. Um, but his briefcase was just sitting there at his office. So I was thinking like, why was he carrying the canvas bag to work? But the briefcase bag was already there so i don't know um planning yeah i already talked about that the weekly planning meeting so this section right here is actually one of the most important so bill had a friend named kent and This was like eighth grade, ninth grade, and Kent got him into business and reading Fortune magazine, and they talked a lot about their futures and what they wanted to do when they grew up. And Kent carried around this large briefcase with magazines in it. This actually also reminded me of Elon Musk, an an aspect of Elon's childhood that's very rarely talked about is and I talk about this in my Elon Musk course, is at a fairly early age, he was he had an existential crisis. I think when he was 12, he was reading Encyclopedia Britannica when he was like nine or 10 years old, was getting into existentialism and stuff. I have a video on that. I have a video on Elon Musk's sort of religious beliefs where I go into quite a bit of depth, more than pretty much anybody else ever has on that. Uh, you can watch that. But basically he came up with, a. he was trying to decide what to do with his life. 
And at the time, he was pretty into finance. So he's reading about different companies, stocks, investing and stuff. And he made a list of like the most important problems of the world and then decided like, I'm going to eventually try to solve some of these problems. Climate change was one of them. Um, so they go through this whole slideshow in the documentary of different people who are sort of role models. And uh, Bill goes through like, you know, should we be CEOs? Should we be ambassadors to different countries? Should we be generals? Should we work in the government? Um, and they just showed different pictures of different inventors. Tesla was there. Edison was there. Uh, several generals, several presidents. So uh, these were the kind of top of the top people that he was looking at and reading about. And so Kent got him into finance. Kent got him into business. And so I got the sense that Bill wasn't as business focused and focused on business success until he met Kent and Kent, Kent kind of redirected him. And this is something one of his sisters said as kind of a throwaway comment near the end in the third episode where uh, she said that without his mother's influence, Bill would have just stayed kind of an intellectual nerd, staying to himself not really interacting with other people, just sort of hold away in his room, just reading stuff. And by forcing him to go be a greeter at the American Bar Association event, forcing him to interact with other kids and compete at this sort of private summer camp they put together with other wealthy families and compete in different sports, and him through this getting involved in business and also seeing both of his parents do a lot of charitable work beyond boards of different companies. And his mother was on boards of several companies and was, um, especially of a woman of that time to be that involved, you know, she'd be the only woman on a board. So he saw that kind of thing at an early age. And so I think all of those things helped push him towards getting involved in business and also he and Paul were getting hired by schools and companies and stuff to program computers when they were still like in high school. So the fact that they were in, they had like such perfect timing in the niche was so big. And this is actually what pushed Bill to drop out of Harvard. So Bill was in his sophomore year and a uh, popular mechanics magazine issue came out where they talked about the Altair 8800. And this was the first personal computer. And Bill and Paul Allen started talking to each other and they said, hey, we're gonna miss out on this revolution. Like this is a paradigm shift because all computers before then were these big mainframes that took up a whole room. And so this personal computer that was, you know, this big, you know, the size of maybe two or three Xboxes stacked on top of each other it was a paradigm shift and Bill was like, well, I've got to drop out of college because otherwise I'm going to miss this boat. And so then they worked, they went together, they lived in an apartment, like four guys in a small rundown apartment in New Mexico. And that's where they built out Microsoft. So all this goes back to Kent and how he got them both reading these magazines and being obsessed with like bill said there were comments by people at friends at school and other kids at school about why are you guys worried about what you're going to do five and six years from now why aren't you know you should be worried about uh going to the school dance and hanging out and going to parties and, and this is another thing which I talk about in my presidential planning course of just successful people in general. They very often did this kind of long-term planning at a young age. They were thinking 10, 20, 30 years ahead. Uh, one of my surprisingly least popular videos that I did a couple months ago was on Tony Robbins. And he was doing, you know, decades long planning when he was in his teens. And you just see this over and over and over again. Nobody talks about it. And that's, that's basically the in entirety of presidential planning. My whole framework there is you need to be doing decades long planning. And, and how do you do that at an individual level? And it all comes from, these are not ideas I came up with. These are ideas I came up with via studying people who have been the most successful in various industries and areas. So 
Um, so some of the questions they were asking each other was like, um, about these super successful people that, that this is what Kent was doing. This is what Bill was doing when they were in eighth and ninth grade, they were modeling experts. They were modeling successful people. They were figuring out what do most successful, what explains the success of the, all these different successful people. So the questions he asked, and this is stuff Bill said himself, what do these people know? What did they do to achieve their success? There were also pictures of, of guys like Carnegie. So um, there's MacArthur, a picture of MacArthur there with his corncob pipe. Uh, what drove their success? So what are the causal factors? I talk about this in my mental models course. You need to figure out causal models. That's the name of the game. What causes things to happen? So why did some industries have a few big companies and other other industries had a lot of small companies? So like, why are there only two or three operating systems for, you know, com you know, there's Linux, Mac, and Windows, and then you have Android versus iOS. Like, why do certain industries or car companies? Why are there only a few car companies? What causes that dynamic within a marketplace? So. Those were some of the questions he was asking. And they believe someday where they, they were gonna do extraordinary things. So then kind of on a whim, Kent decides, I wanna kind of do something, get out of my comfort zone, I'm gonna go on a mountain climb. And he ended up, while they were practicing rappelling or something, he fell down the mountain and died. And so Bill made a comment about how kind of what they had planned to do together, he had then had to kind of go do himself. And so this kind of tragic event could have propelled him to sort of honor Kent's legacy or, you know, whatever. He didn't talk much about it, kind of internalized it. And um, so that's my speculation of whether, you know, that could have drove driven him, but um, very influential childhood friendship so this is episode two nine minutes and 55 seconds so he also got kicked out oh yeah this was a separate i i missed this so they were all part of this computer club and everything of his like high middle school and high school career needs to be looked at within the context of this computer club because this was like one of the few schools in the country that had a computer club and even had access to computers because as I said, they were remote desktoping, basically a mainframe. And this was when everything was command line. There was no mouse. There was no interface. There was no GUI. It was just command line. So this is where he met Paul Allen. Paul Allen was two years older. So there was an interesting conflict between the older kids and the younger kids. And Kent and Bill were the younger kids. They got kicked off of this project because the older kids didn't were kind of jealous that Paul was Paul had identified Bill as this kid's a genius and so sought out Bill and to work with him on computer stuff, I guess. They don't go too much in the details, but that's basically the impression. So these other older kids that I guess were Paul's age were like, "Hey, we don't want these young kids. They're kind of, you know, upstarts." So they got Paul or, or the group of the older kids got Bill and Kent kicked out of the project. Bill made this kind of, uh, there's a perfect word for it that I'm blanking on, but it basically said, you know, you guys are gonna fail without me. And, uh, and, and if you ask me back, you're gonna have to give me total control. It actually reminds me of Steve Jobs because Steve Jobs got kicked out of um, Apple and then they had to sort of accept him back into the fold because it wasn't working without him. And he went off and built Next and I guess was involved in Pixar or something. Um, so what Bill said, and you can just imagine him being like in eighth or ninth grade and saying this, and he's like, you guys are gonna fail. And then when you ask for me to come back, you're going to have to give me total control. And then they ended up having to invite him back. So it's kind of, um, 
it's an inter- it's a nice window into like his he he had that level of self confidence at a very early age. So. Um, and and that's what you get also is that uh, so Paul at the time at this time was not his best friend Kent was Kent dies, and then Paul and Bill grow closer. So and there was other stuff about how Paul was kind of a corrupting older brother so paul was like oh let's get bill high let's get bill drunk let's you know listen to you know paul paul was more of the hippie type played the guitar wasn't like hard charging like wanted to have more of a balanced lifestyle whereas bill was like 12 15 hours a day just on work and like being a workaholic more like an elon musk type so um that was another interesting thing, just extremely driven. And so that would eventually kind of lead to their split because at the end of the day, they had started off as partners and Paul was kind of mentoring Bill, but eventually the way it turned out is Bill was the one who was probably smarter, probably higher IQ and also wanted to work full time and Paul didn't. And, you know, they eventually butted heads and there's a whole backstory which isn't super interesting, but eventually Paul left, and and their relationship was always strained since then. Um, Paul also looked like always looked older, even though he was two years older back in middle school or high school. Like he looked like a man when he was like, you know, in tenth grade or something. He had the big beard. He had the like significantly taller. Like he just um. And he just had more of that hippie vibe going with him. Had this cool black jacket they would wear. Some One of the friend, high school friends talked about that. So um, younger years, very intense, 12-hour days. As I said, driven by competition and fear of being overtaken. There was this whole court case. They go into depth in the documentary about how he was sued for being Monopoly and then he lost, but then he challenged, challenged it and it was overturned. And he made an interesting distinction about monopolies where just because at the time they had large market share and they had short-term control of things, like they could kind of bully other companies short-term, the point he made is that long-term, we don't have a monopoly. And I think it was about Internet Explorer. They were using Windows to kind of force people to use Internet Explorer, pre-install it on computers. And as we see now, people are using Firefox and Chrome and Safari and Internet Explorer is kind of a joke. And they got rid of it, brought in Microsoft Edge. People still aren't really using it. And now Google is the big monopoly more than Microsoft. And Apple is kind of a monopoly in ways. So, um, you know, he he was kind of right about that and, and ended up getting taken out by Chrome and Google. And Google you know, also basically copied Microsoft Word and Excel and gave it away for free. So um, it's interesting to kind of look at Apple and Google's behavior and kind of compare it to Microsoft behavior back in the 90s. Um, So he'd be sleeping in his office. There's a story about uh, Melinda being upset. They had just had their daughter. Bill had put together this huge mansion that they, the this these construction workers were building, and it was an empty house. There were people going in and out all the time. There was this sense that it was built for more of a bachelor lifestyle, and he was never around. And this wasn't in the documentary, but it's something I've I read somewhere else about Bill, which is that he kind of just decided in his twenties he was just going to work nonstop, and so it was a big thing about them getting married of like could he make the commitment to be married and be like, you know, be as hard charging at at, at Microsoft as he wanted to be. And he, you know, just being so competitive and fear of being overtaken, it was really tough for him to make that commitment. So Melinda talked about this and Bill talked about it somewhat. Um, So Melinda was talked about how she had other boyfriends and there are a lot of other men that she was, I guess, talking to or interested in at Microsoft who wanted to date her. And she and Bill were not super serious at the time. And then 
I guess a year into it, he said he loved her and then she said she loved him back. Um, and so they started talking about getting married and, um, and then she had a comment about, you know, if it didn't work out with him, she was ready to move on or, or knew that she would move on. So I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, she went into his, his bedroom one night and he had pros and cons listed on the wall on his whiteboard about pros and cons of getting married. And, uh, and Bill's parents had a strong marriage. So, um, they had a sense of being in the community, participating, being on boards, doing a lot of charity stuff. So Bill Gates' real name is like William Gates the third, and his father is William Gates the second. And it's interesting, like his father is described as a patriarch. And I, I was reading his Wikipedia, apparently he's six foot six. And just, they said almost nothing about him. Most of the focus was on his mother, which I thought was interesting. So um, I'll, I'll look into that at some point and probably make a separate video on it of like what his relationship with his father was. But the brief amount that did come out of it, like they did an interview with Bill sitting next to his father and his father like, or no, this was actually the 60 Minutes um, video from back 20. 12 24 2013 like his father was not very talkative in that at all and charlie rose was like really digging to get him to say anything all these leading questions and he barely said anything so um i think there's probably more to that but one thing that did come out of that was that bill's father was very much into philanthropy and so it seems like he kind of leaned on his son to really focus more on philanthropy and giving back. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and there's some good pictures of like Bill and Melinda together before they got married. And there's a whole story of how they met. Like apparently they were both going to a dinner and then there were two seats left. They both got there late. She sat down and then there was one seat left and then he sat down. He asked her out and he was like, okay, two weeks from this Friday, can you go on a date? She was like, that's not, no, actually they, he invited her to go out dancing with him and a bunch of other people. And she already had a date or had plans that night. And then months later, they met in, randomly in the parking lot. They were parked next to each other. They started talking. He asked her out two weeks from that Friday. She said, no, that's not spontaneous enough. And then I guess he got her number and he called her at her apartment an hour later and said, hey, is this spontaneous enough for you? And then they started dating. And she, I guess he really opened up to her. She she talks about how he really opened up and was quite vulnerable to her from the very first date. She thought it was just going to be a date or two and it wasn't going to work out. And so she saw a very different side of him, more of a tender hearted side of him um than was seen in the public so th they talk about that and then um another really interesting thing i was not sure whether to put this under thinking skills or business but he plays bridge and some other card games with david the documentarian and with warren buffett there there's a whole thing about bill and and warren being bridge partners but he describes how he got into it and what he learned from his grandmother. So his grandma, he noticed that she started winning. She won card games a lot. And what he learned is that she knew the patterns of what to look for. And she kept track of the cards that had gone by. And this is like in poker, like card counting. You have to maintain part of the challenge of it is you're thinking about what cards have already gone by and therefore those cards are not part of this picture. So you can narrow down and calculate probabilities of what's most likely to happen next. It's kind of like if a player gets injured in football, like in the Super Bowl that just happened a week or two ago, um, Odell Beckham Jr. got injured. And so the whole defense of the Bengals changed because the Rams no longer had him and he was their star wide receiver. So when you eliminate things, 
strategy changes. So mental intensity, what he learned is that mental intensity pays off if you know the patterns and the structure of what to look for. So that's key because mental intensity by itself, if it's not paired with strategy and the right knowledge, isn't worth that much. You can be really intense working at McDonald's. Or you can be very lazy, but be like, you know, really good at some info, you know, programming job or something and make a lot of money and not be super intense. So it's pairing intensity with structure and, and the right knowledge. So he learned that intensity could pay off. And that goes back to him, you know, in his 20s, especially working super hard at Microsoft. And there was kind of a running joke about how he was always lucky and just seemed to win the different card games. And then Bill said, yeah, in pretty much in every game, luck is a huge piece of it. And he acknowledged how privileged he's been growing up and all the things. And when we get to Warren Buffett, there's another important thing about sort of luck and equality and, and kind of the underlying premise that Warren Buffett and Gates both have with their philanthropy is if you start with the axiom that, and this goes into humanism, this goes back to Steven Pinker and why I noted, you know, Steven Pinker's a key sort of theologian of the rationalist humanist movement, the kind of new post-Christian uh, religion of a lot of people that previously, you know, their families were Christian, but they became more atheist or agnostic, human rights, that kind of stuff. Um, Steven Pinker is like a key theologian within that, uh, religion or secular religion or, or theology. So, um, and one of the key assumptions is everybody is equal. Everybody has equal dignity, equal rights, equal value. And I actually have a course coming out on this kind of stuff of, of understanding this ideology and other religions and philosophies and ideologies and, um, their whole historical trajectories and and uh, it's very valuable to know this stuff to, to model people because they usually don't talk about it that much because religion is largely privatized in a pluralistic, you know, America and, and other democracies. Um, so he made an offhand joke about he's, he's lucky in cards or game. It was kind of a play on on David said, you know, you, you seem to always win and always be lucky. And then he said, yeah, I'm lucky in war and love. So I thought that was an interesting, I didn't really know what to make of that. Um, so relationships. So the friendship with Warren Buffett is really interesting and there's a scene where the two of them are sitting at this like old time diner and uh, they're both eating hamburgers and like Warren is putting a ton of salt on his burger and he's making a joke about how like he his doctors tell him not to do it but he does it anyways and then he asks uh, Bill like what's the probabilities of this whole philanthropy thing? Like what's the probability that this vaccination thing is going to work out with polio? And, and, and Warren said, makes a joke about how he started as a horse handicapper, which is basically when you're betting on horse races, you're trying to figure out who has what probability of success. This is why like in Vegas betting on sports, they'll say, Vegas thinks that this team is going to win and gives them this number of points. And that number of points represents the advantage that that team is seen to, to have. Um, and so handicapping is basically analyzing those probabilities and coming up with what the, that handicap should be. Handicap is also big in golf. So it's like, what's your handicap? So if, if par getting par on a, on an 18 hole is 72 and you tend to get an 80 instead of a 70, it takes you 80 strokes and 72, you have an eight handicap. And so that's used 
different played skill, skilled players playing against each other, they use that handicap number to give them sort of an equal playing field and give them a way to compete. So uh, Bill has an interesting response, which is like, you know, I I think, you know, we can figure this thing out and we can make it happen. And then, and, and kind of refused the question, kind of said, it doesn't matter what the pr probabilities are. We just need to get this done. And then Warren responds, yeah, like sometimes, you know, if it's important enough, you just need to do it. So I thought that was interesting because it, it shows the, you know, the, kind of the, there's a futility at a certain point in trying to be rationalistic about everything and trying to be probabilistic about everything. Most important things in life can't be measured. Most important decisions that a president makes are the most difficult. And you, there's no way to rationalize it at a certain point. It's, it, it, there's a gut level decision. And so um, that's kind of what happens as you go higher and higher up in, in decision-making hierarchies, the problems become more and more difficult. And all of these tools that you rely on at an earlier stage have to largely fall away or, or only take you so far. So even within things like effective altruism, you get to a point where there's no way to assess the probability of a once a one time event occurring or not occurring. So you can only be so rational. And, um, and so it's interesting kind of seeing them both acknowledge that make a little bit of a joke about it and and kind of moving to a the next stage of their of an intellectual evolution of of how they make decisions and i talk about that quite extensively in the think like a potus course um so it's really interesting how they met they met in 1991 because of his bill's mom bill bill's mom was like you need to meet this guy he was the number one investor at the time and and he's like i'm too busy working on all my software and she insisted so bill's like okay i'll fly out there on my helicopter i'll spend 90 minutes with him and then i'll tell him i have to leave asap because i have a bunch of stuff to work on and he found out they actually had a ton in common and they were kind of intellectual soulmates so Bill made an interesting comment of basically saying he always thought he'd run into people who asked these kind of questions that uh, Warren asked, but Warren was the first pe person he met who actually asked these key important questions. And, uh, and I use MS here for Microsoft, so... Interestingly enough, kind of like Facebook, where it used to be the Facebook, and then um, it was like, no, just make it Facebook. Microsoft used to be capital micro dash capital S soft, and later it became Microsoft one word. <clears throat> so um, the questions Warren asked were, why can't IBM beat Microsoft? What are the economics of Microsoft? How do you find smart people in the things that you do at Microsoft? How do you price your stuff? How do you decide what to price? What price to charge? So these are key kind of strategic level questions. And the, these are key questions that Warren asks of any business he's thinking about investing in. And when he's thinking about his value, whole value investing framework. So um, it just goes to show kind of how somebody at that level thinks and how rare it is you know for bill to have gone through his whole life and never met somebody who asked these questions at the time these were definitely not as mainstream questions and was not as much common knowledge and there wasn't the internet so it makes some sense but it is really surprising that bill never ran into anybody else who thought like this but even today i find with a lot of entrepreneurs they don't think about this stuff they're not um they're not great about these kind of questions so i wouldn't say so much has changed even from then and people are sometimes surprised for example with elon musk 
that he thinks quite a bit, a bit about these issues. He, he doesn't talk about it that much. It's not sexy to talk about it. It's not cool to talk about this stuff, but he does think about it. And um, I talk about that a, a little bit in the course. There just isn't that much information in general about these kind of things. Um, so yeah, only met a handful of people, mind like his own. And then Buffin made a comment that kind of closed out this the uh, segment saying, you know, kind of his view on friendship or relationships is that if they make you better than what you would otherwise be, that's the ultimate gift. And the way that the documentary itself actually ends with is a line by his mother saying, it's not what you get or what you give that's important in life, but it's who you become. And Tony, Robin, Tony Robbins uses that line as well, or a version of it. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, whole thing about equal value of all human lives, 31 billion. So Buffett said, like, when you have that axiom of everyone's equal, it directs you to where you put your money and efforts into and the people you attract. So I thought that was really interesting. He, he, it's it's almost like a theory of attraction uh, framework of of spirituality or of relationships, uh, or no law of attraction. So I thought that was interesting. I, I it's hard to imagine being it's hard to imagine Warren being like super into law of attraction, but it actually wouldn't surprise me that much. And I, I think it's true. You do attract people on a similar wavelength. Um, one of the interesting things about philanthropy in general and the politics of it and, and the politics of sort of equality is that a lot of the focus because of politics goes into equality at the national level and within America, within the United States, as opposed to the idea of people in other countries are just as valuable as Americans. And that goes against the idea of uh, nationalism. And so another key thing is like, it's hard to get governments where the politics and elections is about, hey, what are you doing for me as a citizen? It's harder to get that government money to go to people really struggling in the third world. So I do find a bias in a lot of people towards focusing on equality issues within their own country, as opposed to worldwide. And um, that's opened up to me, especially with teaching on Udemy. The majority of my students are not in the United States, whereas my friends in academia, the, at least the ones that are in the United States, all of their students are Americans, except for the ones that are international students, which are a very small minority. So it's a very different experience teaching online when the majority of your students are not in the US and, or are not of your nationality and just the the world view of that so this falls into some stuff i've talked about elsewhere of this whole idea of being an international citizen or being a citizen of the world there's other memes like being a citizen of the internet and uh, globalization and just kind of i think there is a lesson here in being aware of what's going on in the world beyond just your individual country and if you look at what various ex-presidents or former presidents have done in terms of philanthropy a lot of what they're doing is not in the United States. It's solving problems internationally. So there's some interesting lessons there, I think. Um, and just in terms of worldview and to have a really comprehensive view of the world and, and problems and world markets. Uh, and this is another interesting thing of finance as well as investing in other countries and having to understand those countries in order to invest in them. And a lot of the growth is happening, you know, outside of the U.S. now. So investing in other countries kind of forces you to learn some of those things. And investing forces you to learn about other industries. That's another big thing with Elon Musk. Getting into finance at a young age, you have to learn about different sectors. Same thing with Warren Buffett. You have to learn about how different sectors work and how those industries work in order to decide whether to invest there or not. So it gives you a very high level big picture view that 
you otherwise wouldn't have no reason to get and people generally don't get and can be a big uh, competitive advantage. And Microsoft being a, a sort of worldwide company also gave Bill that perspective. Um, so I think that's big. Climate change as well being very global, something both Elon Musk and Bill Gates are working on. So uh, I said something before about the interview asked the question of, well, Bill, that's not inspiring to be solving polio, but not, you know, helping that one woman who was crippled and had the, the uh, crutches. So part of this, this is in that line of thinking of Bill views the emotional connection as retail as opposed to selling wholesale. So he uses this framework from being at Microsoft selling, you know, software where selling to individual customers is not nearly as big a business necessarily as selling to companies where they're going to install micro windows on every computer selling to schools where they're going to install it on every computer. And a lot of beginning entrepreneurs, they just in general, they tend to scratch their own itch and their itch is usually a consumer problem, not a business problem. So there tends to be a bias of just the general public, but even most entrepreneurs in terms of thinking in terms of retail and selling to cust you know, regular consumer customers, as opposed to selling to business and government and nonprofits and stuff. So Bill likes to think at that, he, he literally says he, he looks for the 10 to the sixth or 10 to the seventh magnitude. So it shows his mathematical side and, you know, in physics, especially when you're looking at stuff that's extremely small to, you know, uh, particle physics to, which is like 10 to, I don't know, the negative 10th, negative 20th up to the, the largest galaxies in the universe, which is like 10 to the 30. So using the vast majority of people never even learn to use orders of magnitude because they never think about things that have that range of scale. And so just learning this area of math and kind of exponential stuff, same thing with Bitcoin. People are constantly surprised, like, why is why does Bitcoin go up and down so much? It's the network effects. It's Matt Metcalf's law. And so if you don't understand exponential stuff, you don't understand technology and technology growth where things can grow exponentially and it's not linear anymore. So um, that's a kind of an abstract level thing. But if you do really want to model him and other people like him, you do need to think at this level. You know, Elon Musk with the Giga Factory, largest factory in the world. So these guys from a young age are thinking about stuff at the largest scale. And that's key to their creativity and, and thinking differently. Steve Jobs tagline with Apple, think different. So uh, more bang for your buck, not, yeah. So I guess I put that here twice. And, and yeah, Bill had like a big smile on it. That's why I put the smiley face because Bill had like a big kind of smile, kind of smirk when David asked him, well, if it's if it's not inspiring, and then Bill says, well, yeah, David says like, well, it wasn't inspiring. Like bang, getting more bang for your buck isn't in, in, inspiring, Bill. And he, he there's almost this lecturing tone. And then Bill's like, well, too bad. The world has limited resources. And then David says, well, if it's not for inspiration, then what is it for? And then Bill says optimization. So Bill was working on optimization problems back in middle school and high school. That scheduling problem was an optimization problem. And this whole thing of limited resources, there's a whole class of problems that are called resource constraint problems. And there's a whole area of math and computer science and engineering that's pretty interesting um, and is related to productivity. And it gets into government and kind of a presidential framework of when you're solving a problem in an executive role, you need to think about we can't solve everybody's problem. 
some people are going to die. Some people are going to get sick. Some people are going to get injured. We can't save everybody. We can't do everything. We need to save or help as many people as we can with the limited resources we have because we don't have infinite money. And so, again, that's not inspiring, but it's what you have to do as a president, as an executive, as a decision maker when you're allocating resources. And so, you know, I thought it was interesting. Bill said disease eradication, that's magic. And it's part of Bill sort of building his legacy. Um, it somewhat falls in line with some of these other tycoons or uh, monopolists of previous generations where they were pretty ruthless in their business life, but then they made a lot of money and they gave it all away. So um, Rockefeller Foundation, Carnegie Foundation, Ford Foundation, building all you know all these libraries and research centers and giving away all this money um there's somewhat of a standard operating procedure of doing this later in life so there wasn't a huge amount of stuff on business um there was the monopoly thing which i already talked about and there was a comment about these civilization war games. So uh, civilization is a very popular PC video game, especially. And it's basically like you play as the emperor of a country or a king of a country and you build out your resources and you, you know, farm and the farm brings in gold and then you go spend the gold to build your army and then you use the army to take over other countries and build your empire. Um, sort of like getting to play pretend as Alexander the Great or something. That's kind of like the archetype. So uh, Mark Zuckerberg played these kind of games as a kid also. And other, I have noticed in the backgrounds of, of other people of like the Elon Musk and sort of the Gen X and millennial entrepreneurs, a fair number of them have played these games and it builds a certain kind of mentality around strategy and grand strategy. Um, and so these kind of games are used to build, um, to build understandings of, of strategy. And there is a, there is a line of thought where business strategy and military strategy have a lot of crossover and you can watch my, um, I was really surprised when this podcast came out, um, hardcore history with Dan Carlin. Uh, he did an Elon. He did an interview with Elon Musk, and the title of the video is "Interview with Elon." Doesn't even have Musk in the title, and it kind of flew under the radar. But it's the only interview, except for the one um, Elon did with the Air Force, where he really gets into military strategy. And you learn. So I did a summary of that video, which is in my Elon Musk playlist. Um, you learn about like the depth of Elon Musk's familiarity with military strategy. And like, it's quite impressive. And you you would never think he had that unless he talked about it on this podcast. So uh, I do recommend checking that out. And um, and so there there is that correlation. And I, I've found a number of entrepreneurs and other kind of executive types where they do kind of have a fascination with these kind of strategy video games. And then they carry that over into their business strategy. Um, Bill talked about how, you know, he's kind of humble. Like he's, he doesn't view himself as like a general purpose entrepreneur. He views himself as very much being in innovation businesses and technology. And like he has a kind of narrow expertise in those areas. And he tries to take that and apply it within philanthropy. He also talked about he likes to push the level of risk. So th that's another kind of interesting thing about philanthropy is that it can tend to attract people who are not huge risk takers. Because the people are the huge risk takers. They tend to, you know, want to go to Wall Street and make a ton of money and stuff. And, and so I think part of how he looks at his approach to philanthropy is he, he takes things on that other people are too scared to do or they see as too high risk 
Whereas in technology in Silicon Valley, it's very normal to be taking a lot of risk that it's part of the Silicon Valley culture that doesn't really exist most other places. Another interesting thing actually is that Bill and Jeff Bezos are both based out of Washington State in Seattle, not Silicon Valley. So it's interesting that they're kind of in a different hub. Um, and he likes to, he said he likes to focus on thing where things were without leadership and vision, it's not going to happen. So that again, again, shows you thinking about strategy, the value of strategy and vision being a key component of strategy and risk taking. So these are all some kind of, you know, with risk taking, you also go to the middle, the military metaphors of just like, you know, as a general, you have to be willing to take some level of risk. People are going to die. Bad things are going to happen. You can't just try to be too safe. So um, I thought that was another kind of, I'm speculating a little bit here, but I thought these were key insights. And then philanthropy. So I already talked about parents worked on the boards, various boards. Um, some were just regular business boards. They weren't philanthropic. And then some of them were. Uh, he started out giving away computers, wasn't that effective, and wanted to look at the deeper issues. And it's kind of realizing, like, it reminds me kind of of the, uh, some of you may remember the $100 laptop project, and it was super inspiring at the time. And then people realized, like, kids aren't just going to teach themselves with just a laptop. And there's bigger fish to fry than just giving people computers. And this gets into some of the bias that can exist if you grow up in a wealthy family or even just a middle class family in the United States that's still top five or 10% income worldwide. And so you can kind of assume, well, all I had was just, I was just in my room reading books and on my computer. And you, you don't factor in all the sort of advantages and privileges of just having all that wealth and parents taking care of all the stuff and stable house, home life and everything in private school. So part of that bias comes into play of thinking that the issue is, oh, they just don't have the computers or, oh, they just don't have this one resource. When actually, when you peel back the layers of the onion, there's all these deeper level issues. It reminds me of, um, there was an issue where kids, kids were, uh, these poor kids in a school, a lot of them weren't eating breakfast in the morning. And they found that just by feeding them breakfast in the morning, it like raised up all their grades by an average of a, an entire grade from like a C to a B, just giving them lunch, uh, breakfast and I think maybe discount lunch or free lunch as well. So like if you model the problem at the wrong level of analysis, then you're not going to understand all the causal factors. So I think he had a, a realization somewhat like that. I don't, this is me speculating, but um, what he got into was safe, was energy, the climate change problem, and then nuclear power being a key aspect of that. So safe, clean power. Eradicating polio and a few other major illnesses, diseases with vaccines. And uh, so climate change and energy are kind of similar. And uh, toilets and sanitation, excuse me, again, that's health. So you basically have climate, and you have health and you have different sub areas within each of them. And there was a really interesting kind of offhand comment where Bill said, like, we need to fund a thousand crazy ideas. And that's how you figure out some of these problems. You know, one out of a hundred of them is going to be the solution. And you just need to allocate capital and fund a bunch of different things that each have a, he, 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 there, he didn't give a huge amount of detail, but the interviewer asked him like, Hey, we just looked at that cool project of like capturing carbon. And he said, he asked Bill, like, what chance do you think it, it's has of succeeding? And he said, I think it's a good chance. And he's like, yeah, I think it's like a 40% chance. So like 40% chance was considered very good. And, and in high-risk innovation, 
that's considered very good. 40% chance is considered very good. And in, in venture capital, you're planning for nine out of 10 companies to go bust and one of them to be a unicorn and pay for all the rest and give you a profit. So um, it's a good example of like the levels of risk taking and, and how that risk is managed by people who allocate a lot of capital to try to solve big problems. He also talked about like usually it takes 50 years to bring something online to make it ready to go. And they're trying to massively accelerate that. So it, that also gives you like, that's kind of the perspective that's used by foundations and government agencies where they're funding basic research, which is kind of like the early stage research, which is like at the most theoretical, not theoretical level necessarily, like, but, but the most basic level of just like, let's explore new materials that might be stronger than our current materials so we can build better bridges or something. And, and so that goes all the way back from like building a bridge to like, how can we come up with a better nano tube that's stronger? Or like, how can we figure out the secrets of spider webs and figure out what makes them strong so we can create an artificial version of that so we can create stronger fibers that can go into building a bridge. And so that 50 year timeline from the basic research of studying the, the, the spider web material to turning it into like a relatively cheap product that can be sold in bulk and people all around the world are building bridges out of it. That's a 50 year cycle. So that's the kind of time scale he's using. And, and anybody who's in that role is thinking in those kind of 20, 50, 10, 20, 50 year time scales. And that's part of, you know, that goes into presidential planning as well. That's a big foundation of the courses. You need to learn how to think at those time scales and what are the best practices of people who think every day at that time scale? And then how do you apply that to your personal life? So he worked with some well-known inventors on the uh, safe nuclear thing and uh, basically making it impossible for it to have a meltdown. And instead of using like high grade nuclear material, they found a way to use the spent fuel from previous nuclear reactors that's just being stored in a semi, you know, safe way currently. So using existing depleted uranium waste as fuel and just using that depleted waste would power the country for the next 125 years. So that's safe nuclear, and that's part of his larger climate change plan. So he broke it down. He said, you have to look at each sector of emissions. So cars and transportation, uh, natural gas generators for generating electricity, trans um, I said transportation, animals, you know, cows, and other sources. You need to look at each source of carbon and figure out what's the solution for this type of emissions. And then to what extent we can we capture it out of the air? So he breaks down a problem into pieces and then he tries to solve each of those pieces. He doesn't necessarily look for one thing that's gonna solve everything. And, and so uh, he all mentioned, also mentioned stuff about batteries so Elon's talked quite a bit about batteries, but there's a lot of interesting batteries that you wouldn't necessarily think of. Like there's lithium ion batteries, but there's also things like a, a water tower is a battery. So you can use solar power, for example, to pump water up against gravity. And then when it gets dark out, you can use that water coming back down to generate electricity during the night. So that's an example of using gravity as a as a form of a generator or not generator, but uh, a battery. And there's similar types of batteries where you have like a very huge metal block and you put it in an elevator. And so when the wind is blowing or when the sun is shining, shining, you use that electricity to pull that thing up. And then when there's no electricity, it goes down and it generates electricity by going down. Same thing in, in hybrid cars. When you apply the brakes, that will run a generator. That resistance will turn into a generator that will generate electricity and, and electric cars too. So um, 
creative ways of thinking about storage of energy. That's a huge deal in climate issues. Um, because you just have intermittent energy. And then we already talked about the toilet sanitation wash thing. Uh, there was an issue with Trump where the Trump, um, something about they changed or they canceled the trade deal with China. And so that imperiled, basically you can't build these nuclear power plants in the US because there's a not in my backyard syndrome and people are scared of it and the political will just isn't there. And so, and you can't just do one. It's very expensive to just do one. You wanna do like 10 or 20 of them where you get economies of scale. And that's again, Bill thinking in terms of scale. And so there was this whole deal to get them built. Like Bill had to negotiate with President Xi in China for like 10 years to get the permission from everybody to transfer this technology to China. And so the deal was pretty much ready to go. And then Trump, blew up the uh, trade deal or changed it or something. It's They didn't go into the details of it. It's, I know it's super complicated to, to get into that kind of stuff, but basically uh, that, put, that put that whole thing on ice and it's not clear where it is now, but um, they were going to build a bunch of these in China. So, and, and China's doing a lot of interesting things in terms of climate and, and pushing technology in a lot of different areas. So uh, that's it for philanthropy. And actually, you know, something that didn't come up, I, I could have sworn I had notes about it, but um, uh, Melinda is a partner and they talk several times about she, how she's an equal partner in the philanthropy and in the foundation. And um, my understanding is even though they're divorced now or they're getting divorced, they're still going to both work on the foundation together. And there was a, there's a whole thing in the documentary about how she, so, and this could go back to her Catholicism, but she was raised to be a stay at home mom and didn't want like being in the limelight, whereas Bill was very in the limelight. And then when they started the foundation in 2000, the whole idea was they were going to be equal partners in it. But then, um, Bill was doing all the press and she was staying at home and didn't like to be in the limelight. And so he was getting all the credit for everything. And she was upset because she was supposed to be an equal partner, but the press w wasn't giving her credit. And so she had to decide either I stay behind the scenes or I break out of my shell, but then I'm no longer a private person. And so she decided to do that. And another thing that she talked about was like, Bill has more data in his head and he's more kind of analytical where she's better with people, better at interacting with people. And she also thinks about women's issues and stuff that Bill wouldn't necessarily think about. So there was an example of like, they were setting up these stalls and she was thinking about, well, women need to be able to bring their children into the stall with them. And if the stalls are too low and they feel like the men can be looking at them from above, above the stall, then they're not gonna wanna use it. So uh, issues like that, she's good about and they brought that up in the um documentary so uh and then finally minimalism so there wasn't as much about this here but i thought it was so important i might as well make it its own section and uh i've talked about this with my natural rhythm planning and and my own kind of approach to minimalism i'm making this video right now and in, in one note 2007 and I made a, a video on my channel recently, which was, was surprisingly popular on just called my 15 year experiment, how I've used OneNote 2007 for the past 15 years. And the, the way I got this is like the vast majority of the successful people I've modeled, they're not using any complex technology or, or very little of it, very, very particular about like they, they don't do it unless they have to. They're very old school, they tend to be. And so I really try to avoid using a bunch of high-tech stuff if there isn't a really good reason. And so some examples of that are, you know, his think week, he goes to a small cabin, no distractions, nobody else around. He has somebody bring him food twice a day. And he's got his little mini fridge full of Diet Coke, cans of Diet Coke. So... You know, it's all about blank books, 
you know, blank notebooks with handwritten notes on it, no laptop, no phone, no tablet. It's, it's kind of funny. Like you hear about these Silicon Valley engineers who are making mid six figures or CEOs or managers, they'll work at Facebook or Microsoft or Apple or whatever, and they'll make all this tech and they'll make tech for kids and stuff, but they don't let their kids use any of it or it's very tightly controlled and it's very limited amount of time per day. They're not letting their kids play these dumb games. They're not letting them get sucked into the, all this like distraction stuff. So, you know, and, and a lot of them don't do it themselves either. You know, they'll restrict their kids heavily on it, but they'll also restrict themselves using it. So, uh, you just have to be careful about this tech stuff because when you get addicted to it or you're using it for the wrong reasons, you know, just a lot of high performer people, they're just not doing it. So, you know, do not fall in love with these apps. Uh, so yeah, scribbles endlessly on whiteboards. A lot of tech companies actually, they will paint their walls with this special surface that basically makes the entire wall a whiteboard. And so there's stuff about how Bill likes to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with exports and then create drawings, sort of mind maps or flow charts on a, a whiteboard. And there's an example of that actually, where he draws a sort of system. If you know what a systems dynamics uh, diagram is, it's kind of like a flow chart, but it has feedback loops and those are integral to its uh, functioning. He draws one of those for one of the, um, I think vaccination examples, or no, it's sanitation. He kind of breaks down how he, visualizes and conceptualizes the uh, sanitation issue and how that helps with stopping the pred spread of polio and other stuff. Um, and then he reads bound books. You know, he's not using a Kindle. He's not using an e-reader. Very simple desk, very small desk, just a lamp there, a window looking out on the water. No smartphone. Now, does he actually have a smartphone and maybe use it and look stuff up? Probably. And just in general, you know, when people do these documentaries, there's something called hagiography. It's kind of like, and all this is one of the conflicts of interest with any journalist, any documentarian, any modeler. To get access to somebody, they have to kind of trust you to not expose too much of the bad side of them. And they tend to only they tend to choose journalists who are more friendly to them to do their biographies or to get access or to give interviews. And this is how athletes or executives or other, you know, politicians, they control what's known about them through only interacting with friendly uh, journalists. So you have to, and they want to manage their reputation and their legacy and everything. So, you know, this isn't specifically about Bill. I did feel like some of the scenes seemed a bit contrived and it's probably not that neat it's probably a little bit more messy but that being said you know he doesn't have a computer there and uh, he probably isn't using a computer maybe he has a phone maybe he doesn't but um you just have to take all this stuff with a grain of salt because most people just want to manage their reputation. They want to have, you know, mostly positive stuff said about them and shown about them. So, um, and, and some of the reviews about the documentary did say it, it had a little bit of a sort of puff piece kind of vibes. I thought overall it was definitely worth watching, especially if you're interested in, in Bill Gates and you, you know, appreciate all the different things he's done. So, uh, and, and for me, him giving that TED talk five or 10 years ago and predicting that uh, a pandemic was like the biggest thing we need to be worried about and then being proven right. Um, to me, that's, you know, possibly the most impressive thing he's done, especially, you know, in terms of philanthropically. It, it you know, when somebody's able to predict something and then it happens, that to me is is kind of the biggest demonstration of expertise. And so... Um, I've always been very impressed by that. And, uh, he just had an article or an interview recently saying like this, this pandemic is, is probably like on its way out, but we need to be really worried about the next one. And, and that's something I agree with. I think that, you know, this pandemic actually wasn't that bad 
and it could have been so much worse. And people, the real question is not what would have been the perfect way to handle this one. I think it's much more about when the next one hits, that's like 2X or 5X as bad as this one, then are we prepared for that? And a lot of people don't think we are. So um, it's an interesting question, but that's it for this uh, video. Make sure you like and subscribe if you want to get more stuff like this. Um, make sure you check out my membership site where, you know, one of the key things that I do that basically nobody else does is I do these kind of modeling reports where um, this video is kind of unique in that I've taken a specific source of information and just given you my summary. But what you get with my modeling reports and basically my modeling projects of different top performers, and this is in my paid membership, is I keep up to date with them over time as they give new interviews and new biographies are written. And I organize the information by subject. So instead of having to keep up with that person or read from a bunch of different sources, we've consolidated and deduplicated information from different sources. And I'm in the process of hiring more and more people as researchers and writers to uh, you know, scale this up and and do this kind of stuff with more people. And this kind of thing really doesn't exist anywhere else. So uh, I encourage you to check out my membership site because you can help fund that research and you can get what I've already created and the stuff that I have coming in the pipeline. So if you like this, you're gonna like that kind of stuff even better. And I do suggest you check out the Elon Musk course um, because that gives you a sense of of what uh, what's to come and, and what I've already created um, and, and how I recommend you kind of approach modeling key experts. So uh, you can watch this on Netflix streaming and uh, there'll be a link down below if you wanna download the notes that I took here, including some bonus stuff that I didn't include because they were kind of random factoids. And I, you know, this is already, I knew this was gonna be a long video anyways, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, let me know what you think down in the comments. Let me know who you want me to do a modeling report on next. If there's a certain documentary or biography you want me to do a summary like this about, uh, definitely let me know down below. Tell me if there's stuff you liked or didn't like about this particular one so I can make better videos and better modeling reports in the future. And uh, just any feedback you have, I read every comment and I try to respond as many as I can. And uh, yeah. That's it for this video and I'll see you in the next one. And I think I said, yeah, just there'll be a link down below if you want to get the notes on this.